very much for this invitation. I'm delighted uh, to be here to take part in, in this uh, um, dialogue organized by the Peninsula Foundation in association with TECC India. And uh, thank you also for the excellent uh, arrangements for hosting us and organizing our, our trip and, and, and all, the, all the hospitality that you have given to us so far. So I have actually taken a, a different approach. I was given four questions and I have framed them in, in answers. But before that, let me um, tell you some statistics that is the, from the most most recent um, FAO, um, uh, uh, FAO review. Fisheries is such an important economic activity in Indo-Pacific region. And um, if we consider all the small scale fisheries, I mean the artisanal and subsistence, I would say a large proportion of these would work in the Indo-Pacific region. And it is known that there are 120 million people directly engage in small scale fisheries and 20 million in aquaculture. And uh, if we take all the workers who are associated indirectly, it comes to 177 million people. And, and like I said, most of them would be in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, and, and, and with this, they estimate about roughly 600 to 820 million people's livelihoods associated with, I'm talking of only small scale fisheries, artisanal and subsistence. But sadly, 30% um, of the fisheries that have formal assessments are overexploited. Overexploited and subjected to overfishing, which means they have gone beyond the maximum sustainable yield. And 60% of the stocks, the FAO estimates, are currently at the MSY, the long-term maximum sustainable yields. And unfortunately, 70%, 75% of the global catch volume comes from stocks that are without any reliable data or information. So, so this, is the, this is the kind of background that, that we are trying to tackle this problem. So the first question is, how do depletion of fish stocks affect the livelihood of fishing communities and fisheries? Of course, it, it is the negative impacts to livelihood, reduced catch, reduced to fisheries, economic dislocation and fishery. And we know what happened during the COVID time. For instance, in the Maldives, we have a fishery that is very reliant on export business, uh, fresh yellowfin. I mean, Maldives is very renowned for catching tuna and, and one fisheries, handline fisheries is reliant on exporting fresh to um, you know, Europe. And, but of course, when the flights didn't come to Maldives and the whole industry almost collapsed. So there, there are a lot of negative impacts. And also the depletion of fish stocks would also impact the overall viability of the fishery sector um, and reduce investments and potentially even collapse of uh, certain fisheries and also with broader economic impact and, and, and social issues. And of course, I should say uh, a negative environmental impacts of overfishing of reduced stock productivity. And some of these, of course, stocks, they are multi-species and they don't necessarily uh, catch the target species. There's a lot of bycatch. So if the fishing effort is high, you're also impacting other components of the ecosystem like the ETP or endangered protected species. And also in the process, you uh, re release uh, marine pollution like the fish aggregating device uses in, in, in tuna fisheries. So the next, next question or theme rather was, how would we maintain um, biologically uh, sustainable stocks? Of course, we have to regulate fishing capacity. That's the, that's the only way we have to, we, have to, uh, uh, we can manage um, you know, fisheries at sustainable levels. But it's not an easier said than done thing because fisheries data is always very poor. And fishery scientists say, you, you never know unless you have passed the highest production of the production function that you have passed at MSY or maximum sustainable level. So it's a very, very difficult thing. But technically what you should do is you have to regulate fishing capacity and regulate fishing gear. Of course, there are some fishing gears that do a lot of harm, like, uh, you know, uh, destructive fishing gears. Like I know some countries, they use explosions explosive gear, um, but also 
maintenance would be uh, establishing MPAs. You know, this is a very trendy term and a lot of scientists are proposing that uh, a way to protect the resources would be using MPAs. And also I note um, there is a lot of this word lack or local ecological knowledge that's appearing in, in scientific literature these days. They see there's a lot of value in the experiences and the wisdom of the uh, these fishing communities to be used. And science has, or research has shown that uh, the knowledge about the stocks is very much in par when you do uh, rigorous, you know, uh, uh, scientific uh, uh, assessments, scientific uh, um, uh, data collections. And also you could use uh, adaptive management to enhance research and monitoring uh, uh, to promote the management. Um, and, and more recent a development is use of management strategy evaluations, which is a, a computer simulation approach where you simulate the, 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 the population and, and you measure your uh, series of you know, uh, harvest strategies against a predefined um, management objectives. And it's a consultative process where you talk with managers, you with stakeholders you to define the management objective, but the scientists go and simulate this and uh, come up with the best strategy to manage it. And this is happening in, um, in, in the Ocean Tuna Commission for managing tuna stocks. And I know in some countries, this is also being used to manage uh, small scale fisheries. So the next um, question is, um, what sort of technologies can be recommended when it comes to utilizing marine life resources and also focusing on um, capital intensive technologies and, and also labor intensive technologies. Of course, um, if you use capital uh, intensive examples would be you know, factory trawlers, um, long liners. And I know this is very tempting because we have a lot of technology these days. There's a lot of electronics that we can use to find fish. There is satellites, there is echo sounders, and there is also oceanographic information that you can pinpoint where uh, fish, fish aggregate. Uh, and, and so obviously the advantages would be increasing efficiency, larger catches, and, and potential to increase profits, of course. But of course there are disadvantages. You know, high costs may create barriers for entry of small scale fisheries because you're competing uh, against the small scale and, and often at times these are the same stock that the both uh, uh, large scale fisheries and small scale fisheries are com competing. So, so it comes in head-on conflict with the small scale fisheries that you're trying to protect and manage. For labor intensive technologies, um, of course, hand lines, small boats, like in the Maldives, we have a traditional pole and line fisheries and a hand line fishery where we employ roughly about 11,000 uh, workers or 11,000 fishers on these about 700 vessels. And it is estimated that if uh, Maldives replace this type of fishing to modern per sand fishing, it will take only two, three per saners to get the same amount of fish. But for Maldives, it's excellent because we have islands spread out over 800 kilometers so it's, it's very useful for us to have these uh, labor intensive technologies that employ a lot of people and provide livelihood. Of course, uh, the disadvantages um, uh, would be it's uh, not be efficient as industrial vessels and, and may not be suited for um, uh, large scale fishing operations. But I should say in, in Maldives for pollen line uh, vessels, you know, currently we have vessels about 100 plus feet Sometimes they catch about 50 tons a day just in one day's fishing. So it, it, it is efficient in some respect. So the, finally, what we have is the kind of policy measures um, that uh, one could recommend to manage these uh, fishery resources. And, and of course, the key is to have policies directed to ensuring long-term sustainability and policies that promote monitoring and research, and oftentimes when the fishery develops, a lot of the management authorities neglect this regular monitoring. I know, I mean, we all know it's expensive, but, but it's so useful when it comes to managing because you have to have this information, like information of the size, information of the landings, 
and where they fish to be able to uh, develop uh, effective policies for managing them. And, and also spatial planning, I, I, I have uh, uh, mentioned about this, and this is becoming a very, very trendy term and a lot of people are advocating uh, to have MPAs. For instance, uh, there is a scientific consensus now that if you have to manage the high seas fisheries, I'm talking of tuna and other tuna-like species in the open ocean, they reckon that they have to close 30% of the high seas to be able to effectively manage. And they consistently see these, you know, uh, RFMOs or regional fisheries management organizations do not do a good job. So they're advocating for these, these MPS. And, and other important thing, um, definitely for small scale fisheries is, is a social protection, connecting uh, social protection and fisheries management for sustainability. And what I mean is, um, is, is this one, we have, do I have a pointer here? We have the natural systems. You may briefly sum up, please. Sorry? Oh, sorry. We have the natural systems and the social ecosystem that is feeding into the ecological risk and that, again, perpetuates the social, social uh, issues. But most of the time, uh, uh, a regular fisheries management authority would be to have policies to support them. Um, but but this, this particular study finds that you have to be able to uh, support them, um, you know, um, social protection to be able to have these policies um, remain in place for, for, for effectively. Yeah, promote climate change adaptation. And again, this is such an important um, issue now. The climate change is happening. And as we heard this morning, it's such an important thing. And, and the idea here is that I'm propo that, that suggests is transformative adaptation. Like for instance, in the Maldives, our pollen line and hand line fishery depend on live bait. And a lot of uh, uh, live bait fisheries have gone, you know, have demised because of lack of availability. And one thing that we are trying to do, at least from our foundation, is to see if we can use external stimuli like uh, lead lights, flashing lights, or sounds in underwater sounds, to see if we can elicit a feeding response like when live bait are thrown to allow pollen line fishing. So we believe that if this can be made successful, this could be a, a transformative adaptation and that will, um, you know, we don't, we don't need to require live bait and that's definitely a plus point. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.